Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We go back 75 years to May 9th, 1947. The program Murder at Midnight, Terror Out of Space. And we thank you for joining us on this Monday night, day of May. 129th day of the year, 236 days remaining. Christopher Columbus left Spain for his fourth and final journey to the New World on this date in 1502. Happy birthday, Reno! City of Reno officially founded on this date in 1868. We have listeners in Reno that hear us on 1400 AM. Uh, in 1945, the final German surrender to Marshal Georgi Zukov at Berlin, signed by Colonel General Hans Jürgen Stumpf as representative of the Luftwaffe. L. Ron Hubbard published his book on Dianetics on this date in 1950. Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. The Sam and Friends debuted on a local TV station in 1955, marking the first appearance of both Jim Henson and what would become Kermit the Frog and the Muppets. Food and Drug Administration approved sale of the birth control pill on this date in 1960. And on this date in 1967, Muhammad Ali was stripped of his boxing titles for refusing induction into the armed services. America at this moment is paying greatly for her stand in Asia. She's losing world power and money. Boys are dying daily. So uh, I'm just, this is just, this just comes with the price you pay for taking stands that you believe in that are unpopular in certain societies. Muhammad Ali on this date in 1967. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee opened formal and public impeachment hearings against President Nixon on this date in 1974. I don't need to stress again the importance of our undertaking and the wisdom, decency, and principle which we must bring to it. We understand our high constitutional responsibility. We will faithfully live up to it. Committee Chairman Peter Rodino. In Florida on this date in 1980, Liberian freighter SS Summit Venture hit the Sunshine Skyway Bridge over Tampa Bay, sending 35 people, most in a bus, to a watery death as a 1,400-square-foot section of the bridge collapsed. Nelson Mandela inaugurated in 1994 as South Africa's first black president. In 2005, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, selected as a successor of Pope John Paul II, and the COVID recession on this date in 2020 caused the unemployment rate to hit 14.9%, the worst rate since the Great Depression. Passing away on this date in history, Food manufacturer C.W. Post, also Edmund O'Brien, countries Keith Whitley, Mrs. Phil Harris, Alice Fay, Lena Horne, Vidal Sassoon, and Alan King. Like I've been reading about brainwashing and psychological warfare. If the scientists want to come to my house for two weeks, my wife will show you how to pick a brain apart. <laughs> Alan King passing away on this date back in 2004. Also passing away on this date, Little Richard. This is the birthday of abolitionist John Brown, shipbuilder Henry J. Kaiser, Canadian-born country singer Hank Snow, please help me, I'm falling, uh, journalist Mike Wallace and British actor Albert Finney. Birthday number 86 for actress Glenda Jackson, from the Mary Tyler Moore Show, Simpsons, Terms of Endearment, producer-writer James L. Brooks, singer-songwriter Tommy Rowe. Dizzy. I'm so dizzy, my head is spinning. Uh, he is 80 years old today. Candy Bergen turns 76 today. Of course, all her time as uh, Murphy Brown. Candace Bergen, 76. Clint Holmes, fine singer at 76 today. Playground in my mind, his biggest hit. Uh, musician Billy Joel is 73. Canadian R&B singer Tamia Hill is 47. 
And actress Rosario Dawson is 43 years old. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the ninth day of May as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! We go back 75 years to May 9th, 1947... Murder at Midnight and Terror Out of Space. That's coming up next on this Monday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds. But check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on this Monday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we're going to listen to part of a, or we're going to listen to a program, Murder at Midnight, uh, going back to uh, May 9th, 1947. The episode entitled Terror out of space. This is a show that we have just recently come on to a number of good copies of, and uh, it is, the show basically features macabre tales of suspense, many times a supernatural twist, although this episode today seems very science fiction-y. It was produced in New York, syndicated beginning in 1946. What's interesting is I really don't know who who the syndication was behind. Now, there are a lot of memorable writers, Robert Newman, Joseph Bruco, Max Ehrlich, and William Norwood. And interestingly enough, it was directed by Anton M. Leder. If that name sounds familiar, uh, Anton M. Leder not only uh, headed up a portion of the run of suspense, but also produced X-1 for NBC. So there are some uh, serious credentials here. Now, I, I've, I've got to tell you that the show is sometimes, and he, one reviewer says, uh, the show is silly at times, but always camp, much more noir than inner sanctum. It takes the hard-boiled approach to the supernatural. <laughs> well, and there you go. So there, and it is a very interesting, a portion of these shows also ran on Mutual. And we, I don't really know which ones were produced on Mutual. Uh, but uh, what we do know is that this show was originally broadcast May 9th, 1947. A very science fiction-y episode of this show, Terror Out of Space. <laughs> Midnight. He turned and started to walk across the room, and as he turned, Martel moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He picked up a heavy wrench, followed him, and then as Roy reached for the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like a rotten pumpkin shell, and he went down. Then Martel picked up a hacksaw and... No, no, I don't want to remember the rest. It was too awful, too horrible. Midnight. 
The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Terror Out of Space. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, which we prophesy will be long remembered as a classic, is by Robert Newman. A tale out of the news and out of man's deepest fears called Terror Out of Space. Larkin! Don! Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You've got to hear me! I haven't got much time. They'll be coming back in a few minutes and... Don! Try and get this. Try and remember... I sat up in bed, straining my ears, listening. The surf was rolling and pounding on the beach at the foot of the cliff. One of the dynamos was purring away next door in the experimentation shack. And that was all. Had I really heard anything, or had I just imagined a dream that I didn't know? All I knew was that I was in a cold sweat, shivering even though it was a hot summer's night. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. Just what had happened. Maybe I could get it all straight, fill in the gaps that had been bothering me if I went back over it again from the beginning. I hadn't wanted to before this. I'd fought against even thinking about it. But now... Now it was as if something was making me think about it. That's right, John. Start way back, in the beginning. Then maybe you will remember. You've got to. You've got to. When was the beginning? When they assigned me here, I guess, miles from anywhere on the Jersey coast. I knew it was some kind of hush-hush project, and I'd been in the Army long enough not to ask questions. I had some ideas, though, and when I walked into administration and found Professor Martell there, I was pretty sure they were right. Lieutenant Larkin reporting for duty, sir. Hello, John. How are you? Fine, Professor. Uh, I mean, Major. Well, let's forget the Major. <laughs> I've been trying to. <laughs> I think the Army's a little sorry about the whole thing also. Well, that's not the way I heard it. Some of the things you've worked out in the last few years was something. Quite a break, my getting assigned here. <laughs> you think it was an accident? You, you mean you requested me? Of course. What did I take you away from, by the way? Oh, nothing very much. Straight communications, a little radar. Mm. No chance to continue any of the research you started when you were at the university, huh? No. Afraid I've gotten rusty? Not really. But there are just going to be the three of us to do the bulk of the work. You, myself, and a chap named Roy Shields. He worked with Ramsey at Tech. And what's the project? Something big? I think so. We're going to try and establish radio contact with the moon. What? Theoretically, it shouldn't be too difficult, you know. Of course. it. And with the progress we've made during the war, we... Oh, Professor, it's terrific. One of the most exciting things I've ever heard of. <laughs> think so? Well, don't you... Don't you remember when we used to talk about it in the lab? What it would mean to the astronomers, the astrophysicists, measurements that they've never even be, been able to take before? <laughs> yes, John, I remember. Well, then? I don't know. Somehow it... Well, it worries me. How we're going to do it? No, that's all cut and dried. What's going to happen when we do do it? Well, what do you mean? We're reaching out, John. Reaching out into places where man has never been before. We're pretty close to the secret of matter, to the origin of life, and to the mystery of the universe. Sometimes, sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble on something that's too much for us, too big and... <laughs> that's silly. Go pick out a bunk and get some rest, John. Tomorrow, we go to work. The work? I remember that all right, weeks of it. And finally, the big night, the night we were ready for our first test. It was clear and cool, the ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs, as if it were waiting. Every star, separate and distinct, like signposts on the road to the infinite. 
Martell at the table in the center of the laboratory with the charts and diagrams doing the computing. Roy at the power controls, and I at the director. Time, 2302. 15 seconds. Power, 10.12. Check. You're reading, John. 93 degrees. Make it plus 0.2. Check. Time, 2302, 10. Power on. Three seconds. Four. Now. How long to wait? We should get it almost immediately. A lag of not more than... There, listen. Huh? That's it. That's it. We've done it. We're in contact with the moon. Yes, we'd done it. Reached out into space and done it. For the first time since man had walked erect, we had established contact with another heavenly body. Bridged the infinite with man-made electrical impulses. There was no work done during the next two days, just excitement. Public relations broke the story the next morning and we were swamped. Newspaper reporters, photographers, interviews, commentaries, prophecies. (sighs) Finally, we got back to normal. And a couple of nights later... Yes... It's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. I looked at my watch, almost midnight. Roy was asleep in his bunk, and I didn't wake him. I padded out along the duckboards to the laboratory. The lights were on. I went in, and there was Professor Martell. He was sitting at the control table, and he was... Well, he was funny. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. I said, hello, Professor. He didn't move. He didn't answer. I took a quick look at the control board, and the frequency had been changed. A little uneasy, I I tried again. Professor, what are you doing? And then, then something very strange happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. It was just for a fraction of a second. Then... What? Oh. Hello, John. Hello, Professor. Anything the matter? Matter? What am I doing in here? I don't know, sir. I heard the generators go on and I came in and found you here. Strange. Very strange. I went to bed about 10.30. Ever walked in your sleep before? No, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Very disturbing dream. Did you change the transmitter frequency that way? Uh, No, sir. You must have done it yourself in your sleep. Funny. That would make it more of a carrier instead of a transmitter wave. Uh, shall I shift it back? No, leave it. I'd like to take a look at it again in the morning some thinking about it. The next morning, somehow, neither of us mentioned it. I can't be sure now whether we didn't remember or just didn't think it was important. But that night... Yes. Yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. That we knew. It was the sound of the generators that woke me again. I looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. And it was then that I noticed that Roy wasn't in his bunk. I lay there. And for some reason, I was terrified, trembling. There was something in the air, a feeling of... a feeling of menace that... I made myself get up. Slipped on a pair of sneakers and went out along the duck walk to the laboratory. The lights were on again. I didn't go in this time, but... but I looked in the window. There was Roy. And there was Professor Martell again. He was sitting at the control table with a... That same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. What is it, sir? What's going on? Is anything the matter? Hmm. Sleep. Walking in his sleep. I better get Larkin and... I can't leave the generator on, though. Gotta shut that off first. He turned and started to walk across the room toward the master switch. And as he turned... Martell moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He got up without a sound, took a heavy wrench from the work table, and followed Roy. And then, 
Just as Roy put out his hand to throw the switch, he hit him. Oh! I heard his skull go like the shell of a rotten pumpkin, and he went down, dead. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I just stood there, frozen with horror. Martell looked down at him without batting an eye. And then, like a zombie, he walked over to the bench, picked up a hacksaw and went back. And then, bending over Roy's body, he started cutting off the top of his head. A voice from the void and the midnight waking. Memories, things best forgotten, coming back again. Memories of the terror that came out of space and of murder at midnight. Well, such a delightful family program, Murder at Midnight. From May 9th, 1947, did a little more digging while we were listening to Murder at Midnight and found that the show was originally produced by, uh, what was it, World Productions, uh, a subsidiary, believe it or not, of Decca Records. And they produced the show. As you can tell, it's not real deep, but it's a, it's a, a, a thriller and a chiller, and... Uh, a little low budget radio, if you will. Anyway, that was uh, May 9th, 1947. Murder at Midnight Terror Out of Space here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. When we continue following these words on your favorite station, we'll have the news of that date in 1947. Radio. Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream for the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. You the Maraschino Cherry. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 27 inches, yes. She was born in a humble shack amidst the lemon groves of Goleta, California. Mommy, don't cry. You know what they say? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I was going to say life sucks, and then you die. But I like yours better. And with that, Alexandra Johnson launched her lemonade stand. Lemonade, nickel a glass. Every day, even during the frigid California winters, a bone-chilling 72 degrees, you could find her. You can have a sour, you can have a tweet. Little girl's lemonade will knock you off your feet. The little girl with the sour brew wanted more. National distribution franchises, and so she rolled out a well-budgeted advertising campaign. Me and the rest of the dock workers only drink a little girl lemonade. She was made president of the International Sour Drink Association and chosen to give the keynote speech at their convention. You all sat with words of wisdom, honey? You know what they say, Mommy. Always advertise so consumers think of your product first? I was going to say never swallow a lemon seed or a watermelon on your tummy. This fabricated but interesting story is to remind you that it's called advertising and it works. Put your message on this national advertising platform by emailing classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in to this Monday edition of Classic Radio Theater on your favorite station and an episode of Murder at Midnight, as it was originally broadcast Friday, May 9th, 1947. In the newspapers of that Friday, some 75 years ago, these were some of the headlines. The House batted down 127 to 37 yesterday in an attempt to kill President Truman's $400 million program to aid Greece and Turkey against communism and likewise defeated two moves to give the United Nations a greater voice in it. In hot and heavy fighting uh, late in the day, 
Congressman Bender, the Republican of Ohio, moved to strike out the enacting clause of the bill, which already has passed the Senate. This was in a parliamentary attempt to kill the measure. Congressman Eaton, the Republican of New Jersey, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, who's piloting the bill in the House, quickly accepted the challenge, saying, if you want to kill it, let's get it over with. The standing vote then taken, Bender's motion was swamped. Meanwhile, reliable informants in Athens said last night a strong movement had developed to organize a new Greek government with a neutral Democratic premier who would cooperate closely with American advisors on the spending of the proposed U.S. loan and help it establish a fair and supervised amnesty plan for guerrillas. Well, with the Republican leadership back in the saddle, the Senate wrote a new toughening amendment into its labor bill yesterday, 48 to 40. The amendment has three provisions. It would outlaw health and welfare funds financed by employers and controlled by unions, what Senator Taft, the Republican of Ohio, described as attempts by union representatives to shake down or extort money from employers, and the involuntary checkout by which unions prevail on companies to deduct union dues from all workers' pay envelopes, regardless of the wishes of individual workers. The strike of 20,000 long-distance telephone workers throughout the country officially ended at 6 a.m. this morning, but resumption of full service faces delay wherever picket lines are maintained by 250,000 other telephone union members still on strike. The executive board of the American Union of Telephone Workers, which represents the long-distance operators, last night ratified an agreement reached in Washington early yesterday between negotiators for the union and the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. But John J. Moran, the president of the union, said the union was pledged to honor picket lines set up by other striking unions affiliated with the National Federation of Telephone Workers, even though the board ordered the long line strike ended officially at 6 o'clock today. The U.S. yesterday threatened to stop shipments of American grain to famine-ridden Romania if reports of consignments of Romanian grain to Russia are confirmed. The State Department made known the American position after disclosing that the Soviet Union reportedly has demanded and is about to receive 400 freight car loads of white flour from Romania to feed Red Army occupation forces in that country. High officials made no secret of their feelings that the Russian demand, while technically within provisions of the Roman armist- Romanian armistice, was unreasonable in view of Romania's plight. The Miami Beach City Council yesterday unanimously adopted a non-discrimination ordinance said to be the first of a kind in its nation. The ordinance, sponsored by the committee from the B'nai B'rith organization, forbids displays of such signs as Gentiles only and restricted in hotels and other public places. George J. Talengoff, The Florida director of the Anti-Defamation League said other Florida cities, among them Daytona Beach, had expressed interest in similar ordinances. And in Heron, Illinois, Lester Turner received a $20 bill in the mail for his wristwatch, 16 years after it was stolen. The money sent in an anonymous letter stating the watch is long gone, but here's approximately the value of it. Though some of the day's top news stories, as reported in the newspapers of Friday, May 9th, 1947, on your radio 75 years ago today, Murder at Midnight, the conclusion of which you'll hear next on this Monday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. 
Jack Webb on Tuesday's Classic Radio Theater, an episode of Dragnet from 69 years ago, The Big Joke. From May 10th, 1953, a bartender is paid $500 to kill a nice old man with no enemies. Who is it that wants him dead? That's on Tuesday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, but now the conclusion of Murder at Midnight from 75 years ago, May 9th, 1947, Terror Out of Space. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and Terror Out of Space. That's all I remember then. When Professor Martell bent over Roy's body with a hacksaw in his hand... I must have faded. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on the sand outside the shack, and there was Martell bending over me. No, Professor, no, no, don't, Why, don't. John, what's the matter? Leave me alone. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just, just now in the shack to Roy. Aren't you well either, John? What? What do you mean? I just came up here from the cottage. I had a bad dream. I've been having quite a few of them lately, and I... Woke up with a very annoying headache. I came out to take a walk, get some air. I found you lying but, here. But I, I'm telling you, I saw you. I saw you in there with Roy and... And, and what? But I don't even want to think about it. But you killed him. Killed him? Huh. Let's go back to the bunkhouse, John. Take a look. The bunkhouse? Yes, when you see that Roy is where we should be in bed, maybe it'll convince you that you either dreamed or imagined the whole thing. <laughs> led the way to the bunkhouse, and I followed, still shaken, but starting to feel a little foolish. This was the Professor Martell I had studied under, known for years, the man who wouldn't hurt a fly. We went into the bunkhouse, and Roy's bed was empty. He wasn't there. Martell gave me a funny look and started calling. Roy! Roy, where are you? Roy! Without a word, we hurried back to the laboratory, and there was no sign of him there either. Nothing. Wait, he, he must have gone off for a walk too, Professor, or maybe jeeped into town. I, if it was true, there'd be something here, his body, blood... There, there John. Well, right there, in, in front of the switch. But there's nothing there. No. Except that it looks as if this floor was just scrubbed. The floor... What? You're right. John. Huh? Did you change the transmitter frequency this way? Well, no, sir. You must have done it. Just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No. Tell me what you saw happen tonight. Everything you remember, whether you believe it now or not. Well, it was... It was pretty terrible, Professor. You were sitting there... And then... As quietly as, as if he were a laboratory specimen, you took a hacksaw and started to cut off the top of his head. Merciful heavens. Talking to you now, I know the whole thing's mad, impossible, but... Yes, mad, impossible, I... but... You... You mean it could have happened some way without your knowing it? Sit down, John. Relax. Tell me what you know about the moon. Huh? The moon is a satellite, a stellar body, probably formed by our sun in an encounter with some other stellar body. Yes, yes, probably formed at the same time as the Earth. But it may very well have supported life long before there was life here. Life? But we know what its atmosphere yes, is. we know what it is now. But how do we know what it was a million, several million years ago? Suppose, just suppose, that there was life there millions of years ago. Life that reached a level of development we cannot even imagine. Suppose it died out as a form of life that we could recognize, but remained in a form that is eternal. What? What do you mean? In the form of electrical energy. We know that thought is an electrical process. An electrocephalograph will give a definite reading when a man is thinking. Yes. Suppose intelligences continue to exist on the moon in the form of complex electric charges. And suppose a channel is suddenly opened between the moon and some other planet. The beams we sent out are radar beams. You mean they they could come down down the beam, take hold of someone, you, and make you... I'm supposing, John, hypothesizing. But the fact is that the transmitter was set at carrier frequency, and none of us did it consciously. 
Of course, even if it's true, we have no way of knowing whether these entities are dangerous, malevolent or not. No way of knowing, but, but they killed. They made you kill. Made you kill Roy. Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with the place they came from. As for the rest, well, they would be intensely curious about the human body, particularly the brain. They would want to examine it. And I... Good Lord, Professor, do you realize what you're saying? The taking over of a person's body? Yes, to... John, I do realize what I'm saying. Well, I don't believe it myself. Have you a gun? Uh, why, well, yes. Yes, I never carry it. But... Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, incomprehensible, don't hesitate. Shoot. I didn't sleep that night. I remember that now. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it was there then, the moon. It was there all the time, of course, day and night. But it was during the night when I was asleep that it would be easiest for them, that they might try and... and... <laughs> no, I can't think about it. I won't even now. <sighs> With the daylight, I felt a little better. Roy hadn't come back, but, well, there were a dozen possible explanations for that. I went to have another talk with Professor Martell. And he was gone, too. His bed was empty, as if it had never been slept in. I waited until about noon. Then I called headquarters. I had decided that I was going to tell them only facts, things I could believe myself. Hello? Hello, Colonel. This is Larkin over at Radar Experimental. Oh, yes, Larkin. How are you? Uh, pretty good, sir. Uh... I'd like to report that both Sergeant Shields and Major Martell are missing. Huh? Missing? What do you mean? I don't know, sir. They were both gone when I got up this morning. A-W-O-L, eh? <laughs> well, that's my fault. You men have been working awfully hard, and I meant to suggest that you take leaves. Uh, why don't you go missing, too? Oh, no, sir, I, I couldn't. Not right now. Okay. And you carry on until they get back, and then I'll arrange for you to do it uh, officially. <laughs> I stayed. Stayed there in the lonely shack on top of the cliff, alone. And that was the most awful, terrible week of my life. Only the wind, the pounding of the surf, and my fears, fears that were with me constantly. There was work I had to do, but I had to force myself to go into the laboratory. Then, on Friday, they found Roy's body. A phone call took me to town to the local funeral parlor. When I got there, the colonel was waiting. Um... You knew Sergeant Shields pretty well, didn't you, Larkin? Yes, sir. Uh, some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. I uh, wish you'd look at it. Of course, sir. Uh, right here. Oh, good, good Lord. Evidently, the fish were pretty hungry. <sighs> well, no one could be sure, sir, but I think that is Shields. All right, Larkin. Thank you. Yes, they found Roy's body. And that night, Martell came back. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep. But the sound of the generators woke me again. I lay there listening, unbelieving but terrified because there was no one at the station but me. Then, picking up my gun, I went down the duck walk to the laboratory. I opened the door, and there he was, Professor Martell. His face was thin, haggard. His eyes were dead, lackluster, the way they'd been those other two nights. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was using him, speaking through him. Too bad that you woke up, Larkin. You should not have come in here. What do you mean, Professor? Where have you been? We have been looking over your planet, studying it. Very interesting. And now we are ready to go. Go? Go where? What are you talking about? What, what are you... You... You said we. Professor Martell, have... have they... Just a few preparations to make. And then... Then... The voice, that horrible voice stopped, and Martell swayed as if he were going to fall. John. I grabbed him, and he opened his eyes. He was himself again. And when he spoke, it was with his own voice. John. John, for heaven's sake, help me. Help me. How, Professor, how? Your gun. What I told you, don't you remember? Don't you understand? They've got me. 
They took me that night, took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain. They sucked me dry. And now, now they're going to take me back with them. Back with them? Back to where they came from. Not my body, they're not interested in that, but the essential me, the, the, it have its name, shoots on, shooting. And now we are ready. They had him again. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you, you will not remember. You will remember nothing, do you understand? Because someday we may come back. I stood there, frozen, still holding on to Martel. Like a sleepwalker with superhuman strength, he pushed me away. I staggered back against the wall. Stiffly and mechanically, he walked to the door, opened it, and went out. The surf was thundering, the wind blowing straight to the edge of the cliff he walked, and then went over. But before he fell, he seemed almost to hover for a moment, as if something in him was going not down, but up. Now do you remember, John? Now do you remember? You've got to remember. You've got to. I tricked them, fooled them. That's how I was able to get through to you. But they'll be coming for me any minute and... John, you've got to do something. You've got to. It's true, they do exist. And they've got me here. They may be coming back again for others. They... John, they're coming. They're coming. Do something. Do... When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. Written out in my own handwriting, but a little scrawled and jerky as if my hand wasn't quite steady. Some of it I remember. Other parts, like Roy's murder, Professor Martell's suicide, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about it. I mustn't. Anyway, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I'm mad. So now I'm going to burn it. Burn it up completely. White and shaking, John Larkin tears the scrawled pages from his notebook, crumples them into an ashtray, and puts a match to them. And thus there disappears into ashes the only remaining evidence of the terror from out of space and of murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when death comes in some unknown form and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of John Larkin was played by George Petrie and Peter Capel was Professor Martell. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. From 75 years ago, May 19, 1947, Murder at Midnight on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I think I got this new collection from RadioArchives.com. But I can tell you that Ted over at RadioMemories.com has a lot of great shows, too. You can build your own classic radio theater collection with Ted by going to RadioMemories.com. He has shows on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. RadioMemories.com. And hope you will go over and visit our friends over at Eden Pure. EdenPureDeals.com. Promo code CLASSIC3, and you can get you three Eden Pure air purifiers for every stinky room in your house for just uh, $200, and that includes shipping. EdenPureDeals.com, and uh, they are neat devices. Check them out, please. EdenPureDeals.com. Please thank this radio station. Support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time you roll around here 
on a Monday on your favorite radio station. And, you know, we do produce 21 hours of classic radio theater each and every week. You can find every one at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, or Facebook. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Or just go to my webpage, classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about Classic Radio Collecting, and you can contact me there. Classicradio.stream. Also, our social media links are there as well. Thank you so much for spending part of your Monday with us. Have a great week. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.